certainly for Swansea fans, it's going to be just uh, 75 minutes of pure Nirvana. I don't remember a time before John Toshak at Swansea City. He was good, great with the fans, you know, he was as cool as a cucumber, very charismatic, which he is to this day. The guy just had the Midas touch. He was born to lead. I've got several friends who are Cardiff fans and um, and I've explained to them that uh, we don't do anything snipey about Cardiff because uh, that's just not where I'm at these days. Because they didn't, you know, they didn't learn much more than the man in the street, so they didn't go around like they were, you know, Billy Big Shot. Hey guys, I'm Sai. Welcome to Ace Podcast Nation, and we've got a very special extra edition this week. And uh, I'm delighted to be joined by Welsh filmmaker Pete, jo- Pete Jones. How are you, mate? I'm very well, thanks. Nice to meet you. Yeah, indeed. I'm really looking forward to this, um, even as a Cardiff City fan. But uh, I've got to say, I am looking forward to having a chat. Um, but before we get into your film, I did want to, what I like to do with the guests is get them just to tell people maybe who are not familiar with them, uh, just a little bit about yourself, where they may have seen your work before, things like that. Yeah, well, um, this is my first film. It's... Uh, a Labour of Love is about John Toshak's time at Swansea City, uh, which went started in 1978. I've been a Swansea fan since that time. Um, I lived in London for 20 years, uh, where I was involved in music. I uh, became friends with the Libertines, uh, and I ended up writing a book about them. So I'm not unfamiliar with the media. Uh, that was a big success, and I drifted out of music, did a little bit of work in television, and then came back to Wales when I got married and decided to re-immerse myself in my roots, which is football. And um, just the idea for a film about the Toshak era, there's sort of certain films are coming up the four. I think Johnny Owen did his Nottingham Forest film. And I thought, well, hold on a minute. We've got the best story ever down at Swansea. Um, and if anybody can make it, it's me because I've got the passion got a little bit of know-how from working in TV and um, decided to, to proceed with it. Met a guy called Gabriel Clark, who you're probably familiar yeah. with from ITV and his production company. Went down the road with him for a couple of years, couldn't raise the budget. That all ended amicably. Then somebody put me on to an ambitious young filmmaker called Dan Harris, whose offices we're in right now. Indeed. Um, this was three years ago. And it all really kicked off when I got together with Dan and his company. And um, here we are, sort of five years after the inception of the film, uh, six weeks away from it opening. So it's been quite, uh, it's been a long journey and at the, the speed it's travelled at in the last three months, if only it travelled at that speed the first five years, yeah, of course. it would have come out three years ago. It sounds like <clears throat> it's taken a bit of time to get, you know, to get where you are now in terms of getting the film to the level it's at now. Was the, that initial period um, with Gabriel Clark and stuff, was that a bit frustrating looking back, you know, in the Swansea fan in you, but also the filmmaker in you? Because you had this plan, but you couldn't quite get yeah, into action. We, uh, we went to the club looking for investment. We drew a blank. And what was frustrating after that was Gabriel had the idea to do a film about Bobby Robson. And uh, they got funding from Ipswich and Newcastle, his two clubs. So I'd be lying if I said I wasn't a tad envious. Of course, yeah. um, and that went on to be a big success. And I think they've done a film about Jack Charlton since as well, which has also been a big success. These films have got a much bigger budget than what we've done, uh, what we've had to use. But I'm totally confident that what we're going to deliver is going to be every bit as good. Certainly for Swansea fans, it's going to be just uh, 75 minutes of pure nirvana. And... Um, yeah, so I mean, it, it's all come out well in the end. But yeah, there's been some rocky moments where I've thought, oh God, if only we could have found a, a wealthy benefactor way yeah, back. Um, but uh, yeah, all's well that ends well. Yeah, indeed. And I think I've got to say, I saw like um, a little couple of minute preview just you know, to get so I could be more familiar with it before I spoke to you. And um, I've got to say, it looks phenomenal. And as I mentioned, I'm a Cardiff fan, but even I was sat there and I was gripped for the full preview. I was really interested. And yeah, look, Ultimately, we're all football fans. We all in, enjoy that kind of uh, the history, particularly at the age I'm at now, because that was just before my time. Yeah. And I see some of the archive footage, and it reminds me of being a kid watching VHSs of you know yeah. great goals and stuff. Um, 
why John Toshak and why that era? Uh, well, simple answer to that. It's been my passion since I was five years old. Uh, I was in school in Swansea in 1978, and as I was five years old, I wasn't even aware there was a football club, to be perfectly honest. And then this superstar came to the club against all the odds, um, took over, and the, the gates tripled by by three and I went from 5,000 to 15, 16,000 and my school which was, wasn't far from the Vetch was gripped by football fever I suddenly became aware there was this giant had come to the club I got swept along with it when it, when it got a shirt uh, became mad about the Swans something that's endured ever since and so my story with the club begins with Tosh so it's a very personal story to me in that I don't remember a time before John Toshak at Swansea City, so um, you know that, that uh, this this I'm not interested in making a film about the Premier League. As uh, much as I love Mitchell, I wouldn't make a film about him. Uh, Leon Britton, love the love the bones of the guy. Not interested in making a film about him. John Toshak has always been uh, like a giant to me, and um, you know the, the story. What he did was uh, the ultimate rags to riches roller coaster ride and it was just right for telling really and um yeah, yeah right place right time and we were coming up to the 40th anniversary of him of him arriving which was 2018 it's now in 22 2022 the 40th anniversary of us finishing sixth in, in division one if we miss this anniversary we'd have to wait till the 50th year comes around which is <laughs> in 10 years from now and half of us wouldn't be here so We've just about managed to get it out in time for to hang it on that 1982-2022 thing. And, um, yeah, it's, it's it's just a fabulous story that needed telling. Yeah, and I think, John, look, John Toshak is a legend of football, not just with Swansea, he's with Liverpool, with Wales. He's done tremendous things all over the world, you know, in Spain as well, obviously. Um, I am kind of interested in... The, the, I am really looking forward to the film because I'm interested in the story. Like, Swansea were... I don't think it's uh, it's an exaggeration to say they were kind of in disarray before he came, mm -hmm. and like you said, the gates tripled everything. There was a buzz around the football club, which just simply wasn't there before. Um, tell me a bit about how much he changed Swansea's fortunes, not just on the pitch but off the pitch. As yeah, well, well it, it's important to get the chronology right of this because uh, when he took over in March '78. We weren't on our knees. I mean, it would be make, make it much more romantic for the story mm. if we could say we were bottom four. We weren't. In 1975, we had to apply for re-election. That was the lowest point. It was a very slow, gradual climb under Harry Griffiths to get back to a respectable position. So when Tosh took over, we were actually fifth, okay. going for promotion. Now, there's nothing to say we would have achieved promotion, but we were in a strong position. So whilst I'd love to say he came in when yeah, we were at bottom bottom, that wasn't true and that would be doing a disservice to Malcolm Strewell and to Harry Griffiths in particular. However, to, to make to nail on promotion, that first crucial promotion, Malcolm thought uh, a new young track suited manager would just push us over the edge. Harry Griffiths had taken the job reluctantly anyway. He'd done just about every job at the club, physio, player, scout. He was a very reluctant manager. And he stepped down very graciously uh, to be Tosh's number two. Okay. So it was a number of factors all coming together rather serendipitously um, to, to, re to result in Tosh taking over. So, yes, yeah, so it's important to understand that in 75, we were on our knees. By 78, we were starting, starting to come back. To and Tosh came in, and as he says in the film, uh, he just, he just for that first promotion, he just put his magic on it. Um, but if he hadn't come in and we had pr got promoted, would we have gone straight back down again? Would we have bumbled along the yeah. third division? We certainly Could have been battling sort of up and down. Yeah, we certainly wouldn't have gone on the meteoric rise we went on because uh, that was pure Toshak magic. Yeah, he, uh, and I mean, obviously, having a name of that magnitude, he was known around the world as a, as a player, as obviously with the things he'd achieved with Liverpool and stuff. It does attract other people to the football club as well. And there was other players which obviously resulted, you know, followed... John Tosh to Swansea. Yeah. Um, do you remember the first time you met the man in person? Well, first time I met him would have been when I was um, hanging around outside the Vetch as, as a sort of nine-year-old. Okay. I remember him pulling up in a big car, and um, even then, you know, he he, he was he was good, great with the fans. You know, he was as cool as a cucumber. 
very charismatic, which he is to this day. I remember him getting out of his car. It wasn't a Bentley or a Daimler, but it was something of that magnitude, something that you don't normally see. Yeah. And um, I rushed up to him and got his autograph. Um, I must have been 24, I know how many times. <laughs> I was, uh, I would have been 1982, I would have been nine. So, um, so yeah, and then I met him at uh, the first game at the Liberty Stadium, which is in 2005. My then girlfriend I was with at the time couldn't believe that I rushed up to him on the programme to get him to sign it and um, just to be in his in his orbit then was incredible and to see him uh, coming down for the first game at the Liberty, keeping that continuity going and you know it, it was great that the a legend of the club was, was still keeping in touch with what's going on now. So yeah, that those are the first two meetings. And then of course when I got together with Gabriel to talk about making the film, he knew Tosh from uh, interviewing him out in Spain. Okay. So that was the initial contact. Yeah. And uh, we went to meet him in Cardiff. And um, again, that was a, a surreal moment to see him sitting in this bar. And I walked up, you know, Wales tracks he'd done. And that was when, you know, I got to know him. Uh, it, still took, it still took a year or so before he was comfortable in my company mm. and vice versa. And a few phone calls. Um, and then, you know, the last four years, we've been in regular contact. We've worked really closely together on the film. And, um, yeah, I could call him a friend, uh, a colleague. And I hope I've do it, done him justice in this film. I'm pretty sure I have. And, uh, yeah, that's my journey with Tosh in a nutshell, from waiting with, with, with my autograph book to... Mm. Um, to making a film to about him. To making a film about him, yeah. This, this, Thing is, let's be honest. That's all. It's almost like every uh, every kid's dream, and you get to meet your idol. Ultimately, that's every child's dream is to to meet that footballer or absolutely. Or and and, and through this, I got to know Kurt, Alan Curtis, Leighton James, David Giles, and um, you know they, they've become uh, friends, and and they've, they've been wonderful help to the film. So you know, it's just been a, it's just been a, I've been like a kid in a sweet shop, really. Yeah, I saw, I saw Gilo on there. I'm gonna have to send him a text about that. Absolutely. He just texted me now about the guest list for the, for the premiere. So uh, yeah. he's a fabulous guy. I keep bumping into him. I live in Mid Wales, and I keep bumping into him. And we, I bumped into him about uh, three months ago, and he said, "Do you want to go for a pint?" Mm -hmm. I said, "Yeah, okay." It was meant to be a pint, and seven pints later. <laughs> and when I saw him then a couple of weeks ago, he said to, he, he went into the same pub and he said, "Oh, you're that guy who was in here a few months ago." And at the end of the day, there were sixteen empty pint glasses on the table. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but you know, I can talk to him all day long because he knows everything about that era. Or he was certainly there for three of the key years, and um, he's a great storyteller. He comes across great in the film. And yeah, it's been wonderful to get to know him. Yeah, he's one of my favourites. Um, I got to know him through, he came and did some stuff with them um, when the Euros were on. He came and did some podcasts with me and them, Andy and Rodri Giggs. And we just doing sort of podcasts on the games and stuff. And um, I just developed a bit of a friendship with him through that. And he came back and did a few shows. But yeah. he's, like you say, he's such a good storyteller. That's so right. For something like your film, where he's looking back at a period that obviously he was involved in as well, it's... He's the perfect, uh, the perfect face for that. Isn't he? Yeah, and you know, he, he, he's. I think he's the only player to have played for all four of the yeah. Welsh League clubs, and he's still held in high regard by Cardiff fans, even though he scored the winner for the Swans against yeah. Cardiff. Um, and uh, he's just a lovely fella, and um, it'll be great to see him at the Premier. There's, um, there's a lot. I even just in the preview, there was a lot of different, um, different people. You know, obviously had John Bishop, and. Um, a few ex Swans players from that era as well. Was there any? Did you learn anything new about John Toshak during the making of this film that you didn't know before? Um, yeah, I did. I mean, I've learned a lot about Tosh as well um, from going back and looking at a lot of the old archive footage and seeing the interviews with him from that time, seventy-eight to eighty-two, and um, just how charismatic he was. We knew that anyway. But um, you know, the thing is, there was a warmth about him. It's like he sometimes gets accused of being arrogant. Uh, it's not arrogance, it's, it's supreme confidence. And he, um, he's quite mischievous with, with reporters, but there's a warmth and there's a wit. Uh, there's a lot more depth to him than I think people re remember. And then through the players, talking to the players, they all loved him. I mean, they really did. He was one of the boys. He could crack the whip when he had to. 
but he was I mean he was still a very young man he was 28 when he took over I was going to say he was the youngest youngest uh, manager at the time wasn't that's he, right the I mean League. even by today's standards they don't get that young very often so um, he was one of the boys some of the players were older than him um, and then whilst he had the authority and the command of the training field they they loved him and um, he knew how to incentivise them what he learned under Shankly and Paisley in those eight years at, at Liverpool it's just staggering really because mm. he had an intensive education that stood him instead for Swansea and then you know 40 years onwards uh, was 30, certainly 35 years of success in Europe and of course the Welsh job that he did so well planting the seeds for what we're hoping is going to happen tonight you know fingers crossed so yeah. try not to think of it to be uh, honest, it makes me a bit nervous yeah yeah but um I'm, I am interested I've what really interests me about um that era for, for John Toshak is the impact that he ha was able to have on others not just uh the club but like individuals and things like that because like you mentioned he had such an education under those guys at Liverpool he was younger than some of those other play you know some of the players who he was in charge of you have to have so much respect from those players to be able to pull that off because I think it's rare that uh a 28 year old in football terms would be able to be in charge of you know players who are 32 34 it just wouldn't happen I d these days I don't think because I don't think those players would be able to get past it almost you're very right there I think as well you know that egos have gone crazy in football as well mm -hmm. and uh, that would play a part but also he, he, he wielded such authority because he brought players like Tommy Smith and Ian Callahan to the club who certainly were older than him I mean they would have been in their mid 30s and he would have been 29 30 and they were um you know i asked ian callahan and the film was it difficult to readjust to tosh being your boss and he said it was seamless because tosh just had this way um so of course the swansea boys uh, then seeing the way that these liverpool legends were interacting with tosh um the guy just had the midas touch he was born to lead i think jimmy hansi abdich says that and um for those four years he was just the governor and um you know you, you really can't fault i mean it, it went terribly wrong for a, a number of reasons but for those four years that we cover in the film the guy was untouchable mm. what's your favorite moment from those four years four well it certainly wouldn't be my first game because we lost four nil to liverpool in the fa cup <laughs> <laughs> um, I was a fan since 78 I didn't get to go down to a game until my ninth birthday uh, none of my family were into football so it's quite weird how I got this bug um, the Leeds game the 5-1 Leeds game again I wasn't there but I was listening to it on, a, on an old transistor radio the Preston game and just the, the, the mood around the place you know I lived in Porth Call at the time and the Swans players would come and stay at the Maid of Scare hotel which was across the road from where I lived you'd occasionally get a glimpse of them and they, they looked like giants and you know I'm not starting about that time anyway I used to read Royal the Rovers and uh, what Tosh was doing was putting some of the storylines in Royal the Rovers to shame so um, you know the, the whole era is just a, a nostalgic romp for me and uh, they were the happiest days of my life sort of uh, six till, till ten uh, you know which is generally our happy days aren't yeah. they before um, real life takes hold <laughs> and I'm really glad that they landed at that time sometimes I wish I was a little bit older so I could have gone to more games could have gone to games with my mates but I had that sense of wonder which you don't have in your, in your adolescence um, and I'm glad I had that you know the posters yeah, on the wall yeah. and the sticker books and, and everything I mean there's, there's I think kids these days don't get they don't really um, they don't do that as much like because they've got tablets and internet and things like I've got three teenage boys and two of them are banging into football but they actually <clears throat> ne have never had a poster on their wall of like no. football or something whereas me up until probably 11 12 when you sort of go into high school and you discover girls and all these other yeah. things it's you have we, you know that was the done thing you'd have your shoot magazine or your match magazine you'd have posters and Absolutely. you'd have your boy of rovers yeah. and stuff like that and I, I always feel sad in some ways that they, yeah. they don't have that same 
Well, I'll tell you what does make me feel sad is when I look back at my programme collection and I realise I cut all the pictures out of them to put on my wall. Yeah. And I wish I hadn't done that now because I'd rather have these pristine... I've managed to recoup some from eBay, but, uh, yeah, I used to cut up my, my shoot magazine and, you know, Tosh. I'd Tosh on one wall, Adamant on the other because they were my, my twin passions. Um, just giving, giving my age away. But 1981, mm-hmm. that's what it was all about. Blondie, Adam and the Ants. Tosh. Best eras for music. 80s, 90s was the best for music, I think. Absolutely. I mean, the, 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 you got to remember the Tosh era as well. It was a very turbulent time. Uh, as Thatcher came to power in 79. Yeah, so whilst there was... And that had a, had a des- devastating effect on um, on attendances. So when you look back now and you think, oh, God, there's only 12,000 there for some games. When there should have been a full house. Uh, you know, there was a recession. There was Thatcherism. There was all these things. But the, what was going on at Swansea was like a beacon of light amidst all these strikes and, and, and just general social upheaval. So um, it's a weird sort of paradox what was going on down there, which people remember so fondly, when in reality society... It was quite was, difficult times. Yeah, you had hooliganism, which certainly took a toll on, on, the, um, on the attendances. I mean, there were certain games my dad wouldn't dream of me going down to, you know, uh, and I know that's the same with, with, with several friends. Um, so yeah, it was a it was a weird time, you know, the, the music of the time. Of course, you had two tone, you had Dexys, you had disco. It was just a rich cultural time, and I I wouldn't want to set a film in any other era. Really, it was mm. it was um, there was so much going on, and that's why they make programs like Life on Mars and Ashes to Ashes because that time was so it's cul- culturally it? rich, yeah, yeah. For, for better or worse. Um, yeah, I mean, maybe it's just it's just it's just the, the the age I grew up. Some people might look back on it differently, but uh, you know, the the, the Tosh era was entrenched in that time. Yeah, I think everybody looks back on their sort of formative years um, pretty fondly with music and clothes and stuff like that because I think it's what you grow up with, isn't it? I mean, I would I would sit and argue with anyone that the nineties was the best for for music and fashion all day long, yeah. but it's because that's what where I was as a sort of teenager yeah. and whatnot. But um, you mentioned music, you mentioned the Libertines earlier, which you'd uh, written a book on, and um, obviously you just, you're just very clear you've got a, a love for music and stuff like that. Um, what sort of music is it within the film as a sort of soundtrack? Well, uh, if you make a film and the BBC uh, take it on, which looked like what's going to happen with our film, you get access to all the chart music. Mm-hmm. So if you, for example, uh, Johnny Owen's Forest film has got a really heavy disco-led soundtrack, yeah. which I think is brilliant because it, it juxtaposes the, the grimness of an East Midlands city at that time with this very glamorous, upbeat uh, disco music. We, unfortunately, were in no position to do that because, uh, you know, to like, for example, when Tosh took over, uh, Take a Chance on Me was number one by ABBA, which I think, think was, has got a real sort of duality to it we would love to use that but to license an ABBA track would cost oh, what we what we so I'm building myself up for a four year mm-hmm. but our our editor and my co-producer on the film Luke is a fantastic musician and he's basically taken certain songs from the era as a kind of a template replicated them and they sound fantastic and um, when people have asked me what's the music like and I've said oh we've done it ourselves they kind of go, oh, second yeah. best, that's going to be... I can promise you, the music is fantastic. It's uh, it, When it needs to be moving and poignant, it is. When it needs to be up, but upbeat and exhilarating, it is. And I couldn't be happier with it. I really couldn't. In fact, I wouldn't swap it for chart music now because uh, I've got so used to it. And, um, you know, we could even bring out a soundtrack album of Luke's yeah. music because it's that good. It's a, it's it's a personal touch as well at the end of the day. Yeah, it's, well, you um, know, it adds the, and, the other option, if you can't use chart music and you don't have a, 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 someone to do the score, is you can use library music because mm. uh, there's plenty out there which you, can, which you can access for free. However, that might have cropped up somewhere else. So what we've got is totally unique to this film. It's brilliantly produced, it's brilliantly written, and it's, it's, um, it's an unexpected uh, plus for the film, to be perfectly Absolutely, honest. Yeah. Um, you mentioned again, uh, like Johnny's got had, um, he's had a few football films out now. He's had the Forest One. He did um, Don't Take Me Home about the Wales journey right, as well, yeah. and he did the um, oh, I've forgotten the name of it. I think it's Three Kings. Or four Jock Kings Steam, with Busby the managers. Yeah, and, that's it. Uh, yeah. Uh, <coughs> who was the other one? Um, Busby Steen. 
Is it Ferguson? No, it wasn't Ferguson. Pay, no. Pay, uh, Shankly. Shankly, yeah. Oh, God, why did Shankly? I always, I always um, mix up Shankly and... Uh, right. Shankly, Shankly should have come to me first because Shanks is a big part of this film. So um, give myself a slap on the wrist for that. Yeah, I was going to say, the fo- with fo- football films, they've obviously you've got like a hardcore football base who people who are going to watch those types of documentaries and you've got the Swans um, side of it as well. But I think there's a definite market for those football films and the sporting documentaries. I think there's... um, It seems to be a period now with all these different streaming services and all the different things that they are doing really well. And I think this particular story... And I would urge people, even if you're if you're a, like a Cardiff fan and you think, oh, I'm not going to watch that because it's Swansea or whatever, I would encourage you to do so because I think, as football fans, we should look back on those historical eras, moments, whatever it may be, and you can't deny the impact that John Toshak had on football, but also Welsh football and Swansea in particular. And I think that's really important. Um, so I do hope that Cardiff fans kind of don't just... Yeah, well, from it. <coughs> I've got several friends who are Cardiff fans, and um, and I've explained to them that uh, we don't do anything snipey about Cardiff because uh, that's just not where I'm at these days. Uh, Tosh is a Cardiff boy from around the corner, from here, from Canton. Uh, we can't forget that. You know, we pay lip service to his to his Cardiff days, and um, yeah, I hope they watch it. And it, yeah, it might be a little bit of a bit a bit of pill. It would be for me if I was a. Um, what if it was about you know it was set in Cardiff? However, I'd still be very interested in it. Yeah. But you might have to watch it through gritted teeth slightly. <laughs> um, I know Johnny is very broad-minded and he'll see it for what it is. I know, and I know also about other people who say, "Screw that! I'm not watching it." So yeah. you love the full spectrum. But I think this genre of film has exploded recently, and um, I'm no fan of Everton, but I love the, the the Howard Kendall film. I love Johnny's film. I love the I saw one about Aberdeen which was on um, the BBC Gaelic channel about when they won the uh, European Cup in 83. I saw one about Dundee United. I mean, it, 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 anything of that era interests course, me. Yeah. Um, and um, even the, 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 the Arsenal one, when they won the, 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 cup, the, the league in 89. They're just great films, and I'm just so pleased that um, we could join the party and present something that's personal to me and to Swansea fans. And... Um, Thank goodness that story was there. We had Jack to a King, obviously, which was about the Premier League, and I enjoyed those Premier League days, but I've got to be honest, and most of my friends, my peer group, the Tosh era takes some beating, and, um, and there's a lot of politics involved with, with, with the Premier League as well. So some people feel that film didn't really do justice to certain people who were there. Uh, we hope we've done that with this film. And, um, yeah, I hope it's a worthy addition to the canon of, of football documentaries that's, that's out there. Absolutely, and I think um, for me personally, like from a Cardiff point of view, I don't look back on the Premier League days fondly compared to, you know, the days of when I was growing up, the 90s, the early 2000s. They were eras that I look back and I just remember with like a, a warm glow. Absolutely, I've got Cardiff mates who who, who uh, who cherished the days of the mid eighties when you were literally getting three thousand, yeah. like we were getting three thousand? They preferred those days to the, the uh, camaraderie there. Between absolutely, fans and I think I preferred to be honest. Forget the Toshi, right? I, I enjoyed the sort of like late eighties, early nineties before I moved to London when it was, when there were just three hundred of you going to away games. There was a couple of van loads of you all mates together. Um, when you could rock up to the ground, pay on the day. That's long gone now, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, of course. Yeah. And I, I, I really resent that because I just love the spontaneity of being able to go to the pub and think, yeah, I think I'll go to the game. Um, now you've got to plan it. You've got to take out a second mortgage if you're taking mm. a few, if you're taking your kids or whatever. Yeah. So um, yeah, we're losing touch of, of of that era of football, and unfortunately, and I know progress has got to come, but for me, it'll always be about the the, the 80s. But you, in those days, you felt in touch with the players as well, I think, and the club as a whole. It was like a community thing, wasn't it? These days, you feel so far apart. Absolutely. From, from those days. That's something that comes across in our film. We've got several Swansea fans who, who pay, pay tribute to that and how you could... Because uh, they, you know, they didn't earn much more than the man in the street, so they didn't go around like they were, you know, Billy Big Shot. Uh, and they were accessible. And you'd see them walking around town and um, 
and you I mean that, that Swansea team that Tosh took up to the first division five or six of them were Swansea boys a couple were a couple were, were Welsh John Mahoney David Giles Cardiff boys you know, we'll never see those times again you know we've got a team now where or we've had a tradition yet over the last 10 years of a team that's made up of all different nationalities there's nothing wrong with that but it was certainly better when it was all local lads. It's just, it's just a natural thing, isn't it? Yeah, you've got an affinity with them then, haven't you? Absolutely. Um, you, just naturally. You grew up with them. You, your pal went to school with one. You, your auntie knows one. You, you know. Yeah. And that's never to be seen again. No. Um, so we just got to rely on these, uh, these bits of celluloid to take us back. Indeed. Um, and it's something which I'm very much looking forward to, to watching. Um, very quick question to finish. Um, Cardiff playing Swansea. Uh, week Saturday. What do you think the score's going to be? <laughs> uh, well, we're on for the double, aren't we? Um, it's never, First time ever. It's never, it? Yeah, it's never been done. Uh, we're both in very, very inconsistent form. Uh, if I had to say who's going to win, I'd say Cardiff, just because you know, you've got home advantage. I dearly hope the Swans win. Um, yeah, but your guess is as good as mine. Your guess will be different than mine, mm. I'm sure. I yeah. think um, Steve Morrison's doing a tremendous job no, is, with yeah. his hands tied, and I think if they can continue that momentum, then Cardiff would probably win. But knowing Cardiff, they won't continue that momentum, and it'll be a draw, or Swansea will win. But I would. Um, I think I'd probably take a draw now, to be honest with you. Uh, yeah, it's unfortunate that neither club is really, as the season comes to a finish, they're not. Sort of pushing for playoffs, and they're not fighting relegation now. So yeah. it's kind of but it's a rarity, isn't it? Because we're either going for promotion or we're fighting relegation. Yeah. So um, I'm quite enjoying the difference yeah. and just, just being able to sort of relax, take a, relax. Yeah. And uh, will Wales win the playoff? Well, tonight. Oof. I sincerely hope so because if Wales do qualify for the World Cup, it certainly won't do our film any harm. Absolutely. Um, yeah. With Tosh's connection to uh, the, the, this crop of uh, Welsh players, yeah, I'm going to say yes. Uh, I've got painful playoff memories, both at club and international level. Oh, we which all makes love, me yeah. worried. So, yeah, um, yeah. but okay, it's this it's this Scotland thing that's scaring me because I've just watched that documentary on S4C. I mean, they can't do a, a hat trick of <laughs> handball. <laughs> Cheating, can they? Yeah. You say you'd like to hope not, but that would be terrifying yeah. to be in the um, at the mercy of Scotland. Oh, <laughs> my thoughts just go to immediately to VAR and things like this, and I just send oh, a God. shudder down my uh, yeah. shudder down my back. Um, Pete, it's been an absolute pleasure to speak to you. I would Thank love you. to have more time, but uh, obviously I know you're a busy man and you've got a film to finish. Absolutely, but, uh, it's been a pleasure. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Cheers. Thank you.